Good morning. Now, I know there's a transition happening here. So first of all, let's give it up for that, one of the best middle school orchestras in town. What we tried to do outside, and if you have, when you leave, take a look, we've tried to bring you a mini city hall. Almost every department has materials and information. It's pretty interesting. I find that people don't always know everything the city does. Sometimes you think I do things that we don't do, and, but it's my chance and the city, uh, the, the leaders of the city's chance to hear from the grassroots what people think and what your ideas are. So this is not a usual town hall meeting where I, you just line up and you tell me everything that's wrong with the city. You can tell me what's wrong with the city, but you're gonna tell me what we can do together to change it. Because that's how real change happens. You know, change is about us. When Barack Obama said, you are the change, that's exactly what he meant. And so what we're doing today is a format that we've done now in, Five other districts that have just this one and District 7 to go. So I'm particularly pleased to be back home. A lot of you I haven't seen for the last five or six months because together I think we've made great changes in this district and I'm hoping that we will do that citywide. So that's sort of the thank yous. I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce my staff and then I'm going to talk to you about a few things about the budget and sort of overviews of what it's been like being mayor, how I see it differently as mayor versus being a council member, and then we're gonna break down into a small group so that we can hear from you. And remember, we want you to help us prioritize what you think the problems are, but we want you to also tell us what you think the solutions are. And then we particularly want you to help identify the things that we can do together. So I'm gonna just go ahead and start um, with the city staff, and if they could line up wherever you are. Um, starting with the city, uh, um, administrator, Mr. Yule. Good morning, I'm Lamont Yule, the Interim City Administrator. Good morning everyone, Jerry Garzone, Associate Director with the Oakland Public Library. It's a hard act to follow. I'm Sarah Bedford with the City of Oakland's Department of Human Services. I'm Mark Coppin, Interim Fire Chief of the Fire Department. I went to Brewer right down the street and I gotta tell you our band wasn't nearly as good as that band. I'm Walter Cohen with the Community and Economic Development Agency. You'll find planners here, you'll find code enforcement people here, you'll find business development people here, you'll find economic development people here, we're here to help. Good morning. Ken Gordon, Interim Director, Department of Information Technology. Good morning, everybody. Joe Yu, I'm the city's finance director. Good morning. Audrey Jones Taylor with the Office of Parks and Recreation, where we want you all to come out and play the OPR way. Good morning. I'm Kip Walsh with the Human Resources Department. Good morning. Debbie Barnes, director of the Department of Contracting and Purchasing, where we enforce living wage, compliance with uh, contracting, and business participation. Good morning, I'm Vitaly Troyan, Director of Public Works and your favorite pothole person. I always feel like I'm being announced at a football game, playing cornerback from the university. Tony Batts, Oakland Police Department. Christine Calabresi, I manage the city's ADA programs division and we have a pedestrian access and safety task force underway and if you're interested, please come to the health, wellness and seniors section today. Woo! Americans yeah. with Disabilities Act programs. Woo! Hi, I'm Joe DeVries, and I represent the Small But Mighty Neighborhood Services Division. If, <laughs> if you haven't started a neighborhood watch on your block, start one now. If you don't go to your neighborhood council meeting, start going to them, because neighborhoods are safer when neighbors know each other. Thank you. So now you know who to complain to um, in between the breaks. Um, uh, we, this has been, I think, an important feature to try to bring City Hall to the community. That's why we brought the materials. That's why we brought department heads or their number twos. Uh, this is the people who, who run and lead your city. And um, although we may have some massive changes after the budget, um, these are the people who are in charge now. These are people who, um, most for the most part, give a lot of heart every day. Um, I'm going to change the format a little bit, so I'm going to ask the staff to pass out the budget uh, while I talk in this next, the budget handouts, even though we're not going to discuss it till later, but um, I want people uh, to do that. Sharon, if you can make sure that they get that. And, oh, everybody's got it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me just say that it has been a great honor and has been pretty nonstop. Uh, since I became mayor now just a little over four months ago. And um, 
what I find, in, as I said, is what, sort of what I found in the house parties, that this is a, a city that loves. The people here, we're a little edgy. We're, we cho most of us have chosen Oakland. And Oakland may not be perfect, but we like the variety, the diversity, and we even like the disagreement sometimes in opinion. Um, but we are a generous city for the most part. And um, the diversity that you saw today in these kids um, is even more diverse than us as adults. And that this is a city basically that's hometown to the world. That was Elihu Harris's slogan when he became mayor. And as mayor, I've felt that more so than, than ever. Um, we are, as I said, facing probably the worst um, budget that I've ever worked on. Uh, and so what you're going to see in that budget and for you to think about is we're now in the fifth year of making cuts to the budget. And so that means that we have about 20% less employees than we had five years ago. And we're coming out of a recession, and, um, one, and it's one of the reasons why I presented three budgets, and one of the reasons why, and, and, and I want people to come up with disagree to talk to me, one of the reasons why I'm using a three-pronged attack to try to resolve the budget. I don't think an all-cuts budget works in the city any more than it does in Washington or it does in Sacramento. You are a city. And I'm here, sure I'm going to hear about it, that you love your parks, you love your libraries, et cetera, et cetera. You're mad about the potholes, and that's not just the city responsibility. That's partially because of the constant state cuts that we've been getting. And usually we're bailed out by the feds, but there's no extra federal money this year to bail us out um, on our roads and our infrastructure. But we're a city that didn't invest, the, we're a nation that didn't invest a lot in the infrastructure. Um, if you really want to read something scary, read the General Services Report on Infrastructure in America about bridges that are collapsing, about highways that are, uh, were built in, in, in the last Great Depression and it hasn't been kept up. We're a country that doesn't always reinvest in ourselves. The difference is they're really capitalizing their cities and we have not in, in America. When I go across the country and, and whatever, particularly older cities, we have not. And so that's one of the issues. Um, the other issue is that we faced a real real estate um, and a property tax problem in, in, in this state. Um, and particularly in Oakland, last, the last budget, and in, throughout most of California history, I've been told that there was never a recorded year where property taxes went down. Well, last year it did. The, 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 state, the county assessor reassessed every house that had been bought within the last five or six years. And that meant that for the first time in history, property taxes went down. For Oakland, that was a $27 million hit. So one of the reasons I'm asking for the parcel tax is to give us enough time for that property tax to come back up so we can get our base back up. And it looks like there's some, some, interesting, there's some interesting data that's showing that things are creeping up and if we don't have a double dip recession, that we're on the way back up. But why is that important? Because I've worked with you guys for a long time. You want your parks, you want your libraries, you want everything. And we always want everything. So I can say to California, a school board member, I knew that 70% of the population always wanted more money for the schools, but only 45% was willing to pay for it. Um, at different times. It was anywhere between 45 and 55, but not that two-thirds you needed. Um, and so that's what, what we're going to have to think. So we've cut things for five years. We're pretty much down to the core. It is one of the reasons why um, I refuse to lay off police in the worst case scenario. I'm going to ask for a furlough. There's going to be a fight around that. But I'm actually hoping it's not going to happen, because what is the good thing that's happening is in order to pass this budget, three things have to happen. All the unions have to be at the table. And I want to thank the police and fire for being at the table because their contract's not open, but they are at the table. And my understanding is we're making progress. <laughs> and a lot of that credit goes to Lamont Yule. <laughs> As our former fire chief. Um, the second thing that has to happen is I'm going to have to, no matter, even under the best case scenario, I'm going to have to continue to flatten and cut the, 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 the city. And um, we're going to do that. 
It's just because we're in a recession, we have to do that. And, it's, and I try to do it in the fairest way. So if you look at budget C, uh, that's what I'm hoping will happen. Lastly, I'm asking you to step up, um, to step up for a quarter a day um, for the next five years so that we don't have to go to so thin that I worry that we're going to be able to rebound when the economy picks up. I don't want to bring policing down so low that we feel endangered. I don't want to have to close libraries because, you know, I wrote Measure Q and I thought that was the first thing I did as a city council member was to save libraries. But it is so bad that we won't have that base amount. Oh, thank you, save libraries. Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> I hadn't seen that. Okay. I, don't, I wrote Measure Q, but what we did is we said that the libraries have to have at least about as much money as eight, nine years ago when I, when I, when I was a, a rookie in the city council like Libby is today, and I helped pass that. Um, but the budget is so bad that if I don't get contributions from the employees and if we don't get the parcel tax, Measure Q is actually threatened. Now, I'm hoping that we're doing well in negotiations and that we won't get there. But I think that it's a question of how we get there all together. So um, let me just summarize by saying this is a tough time. We all have to make decisions about how we're going to work together. And whatever happens budget-wise, how we're going to make change those to continue to organize. And so I'm trying to take what I learned as being a city council member throughout the city. I'm trying to make those neighborhood beat based consuls. And you notice in my district, I pulled crime out of it because I think it's more about crime, despite what Chip Johnson says. The way you move a city forward together is yes, you have a good police force, and he seems to ignore what I did in terms of increasing the police force, but you also have a well-organized community that looks after each other and cares about its kids. Because the kids in this city are a future, and we now have a city where only 30% of the African-American young men in the city are graduating from high school, and that is not possible in this city. We cannot stand or tolerate that if we're gonna progress as a city. And we together can do something about that, and if we do something about that, the whole city moves forward. And I think we can do that. We won't end crime and we won't attract those top-notch software companies I'm trying to get, I'm not stealing, but I'm getting to expand over in Oakland, right? Unless we have a city that is a good city for all of us. And the reason people want to come to Oakland is our diversity, our energy, and the fact that we're a city that cares, and I think there's no better way to show that we care than to make sure that our public schools make it for this very, very tough time, because right now we are spending more money on our prisons and our universities. And that's, again, not something that we can accept as Californians. When I grew up, and when Jerry Brown was governor the first time, we were spending 3% on our prisons and 11% on our universities. Today, we're spending 11% on our prisons and only 7% on our universities. That's not the way forward and that we are gonna have to start investing in our infrastructure and that means our schools and that means our kids. So I'm gonna end there. Um, We're going to um, um, I now have the pleasure of introducing um, my successor, uh, Libby Schaff, who is also a Skyline grad. Oh, I forgot. I always forget to do this. I'm sorry. Mayor's staff. I'm very proud to have two Skyline grads, um, and they've been working really behind. So, Mayor's staff, can you just come up here very quickly? I know some of you are out in front, but um, these two young ladies. Reagan Harmon, and uh, so I want you to introduce yourself and what you do. Um, and uh, these two young ladies are Skyline grads. Reagan Harmon, I'm her senior policy advisor on public safety. My name is Deborah Hart, senior policy advisor for intergovernmental affairs. I'm Richard Cowan, I'm the community services manager. Hatsune Aguilar, and I'm special assistant to the mayor, and I'm her person in the Latino and LGBTQ communities. I'm Karen Boyd, and I'm the citywide communications director. Sharon Cornu, I'm the Deputy Mayor for Community and Governmental Relations. I'm a District 4 resident and a Bret Hart Middle School parent. Louis Cohen, Deputy Mayor for Policy and Program. 
And Sharon was the Laurel Prince, uh, PTA president, so uh, we have PTA presidents. And everybody knows Sue Piper. Sue Piper watching her son graduate, we hope. Um, and uh, um, and uh, Drew Lissick, who's doing, who's my ombudsperson for economic development. I'm head of deaf in the family, I can't be here. Um, not everybody is on my payroll, but I borrowed them from other departments. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Libby Schaff. Uh, I am really excited about kind of her theme and the theme of this amazing community organization that did all the work today to put this on, and that's the block by block organizing group. This idea, yeah, yay, block by block. <laughs> um, I am excited about this shift. Instead of just kind of talking about lofty ideas, we're actually getting out, talking to each other, block by block. Um, you know, I'm always inspired and always have been. For, for many years, people probably don't know this, I had the office next to Jean Kwan's when she was a council member. So I would always run out of the building at 11 o'clock because they would, would be about to lock my car into the garage. But since she parked on the street, she was still in the office at 11 p.m. So uh, I'm, I have a big work ethic that I'm uh, trying to emulate, and that's what it's going to take. It is going to take this block by block, person by person effort. Um, uh, the mayor introduced her staff. I'm going to ask my staff to come up. There's also one important person that I think she meant to introduce that she might have forgotten to, and Pete Sarna, would you come up? Hi, thanks. Uh, many of you know, may not realize the school district does have its own police department. We work very closely with Oakland PD, and I have to tip my hat to Chief Bat's leadership for really bringing our organizations together and working more seamlessly. So hopefully most of you have had the opportunity to meet and work with at least one of my rock star staff. Um, these people... I don't, think, I, I don't think any of them has gotten to have a two-day weekend since they took their jobs. <laughs> um, I am so excited to uh, introduce to you the District 4 office staff. I'm going to have them each come up, tell, them their, tell you their names and what they work on. Hi, my name is Jenny Feinberg, and I'm the constituent liaison to Montclair and Piedmont Pines. Hello, D4. Um, my name is Bruce Stoffmacher. I am the... Um, community liaison for, for this area, including um, everywhere kind of northwest of, of 35th Avenue, and I'm the policy analyst for economic development, public works, and finance. And I'm Sharita Nosahari, and I'm the community liaison for, I guess, east of 35th, so Melrose, Maxwell Park, Allendale, um, and I'm the policy analyst for public safety, life enrichment, and, and rules and legislation. <laughs> I want to um, just get started and let you start doing some of the talking because uh, I'm really excited about listening to what you have to say. So I know next on the program we're going to have an explanation of how the breakout um, groups are going to work. Thank you so much for being here on your Saturday to make Oakland better. On a citywide level, um, in terms of public safety, I'm concerned with uh, prostitution and the commercially sexually exploited children um, that's becoming an epidemic in the city. My concern is keeping a police officer committed to that program, dedicated uh, to reinforce the positiveness to try to prevent all of the things that we say are really at issue, the crime, the criminality. This program is designed for a positive interaction between a police officer and at-risk youth to stem the tide of all of the blight and all the concerns that we deal with. So my concern is to see if we can keep a committed and dedicated officer to that program. I've been in Oakland for a long time, and I guess when I talk about public safety, I'm, I'm thinking that we want to have a balance also. So we want to, I want to have a citywide public safety policy that doesn't just involve the police. And I want to make sure that um, we're not overreacting in some ways and maybe le using public safety as an excuse to oppress other communities. Yeah, um, I'm concerned that um, very highly paid sworn officers are, are used for um, administrative and clerical duties instead of being on the street. Um, we know that we have um, too few officers and that the officers that we do have, um, we should have them deployed um, in our community and not behind a desk. 
doing work that civilians could do much more cheaply. And so uh, I live um, off of High Street, by the way, um, near Brookdale Park. But I think that a way to get more officers into our communities where they're needed is to get them out from behind a desk and have civilians do a lot of the paperwork that sworn officers are doing right now at twice the cost and twice the benefits. My concerns are very similar to Michael's and Jay's um, and how we can expand this conversation about public safety to include the things that we know decrease crime and decrease recidivism such as education, libraries and other public services. What makes me feel unsafe is not the lack of police officers but the lack of city services and the cuts that are coming down through this budget are going to make that much much more worse including 85% cuts to libraries. So I'd like to know what the, police, the police department is willing to do to help keep us from having to balance this budget on the backs of young people at the expense of their education and the things we know are part of the public safety conversation like their futures. I'm also interested in having a conversation about how public safety can be more about building up our communities um, and uniting Oakland instead of continuing to divide Oakland by using ineffective public safety strategies like gang injunctions and increasing policing. Um, while resources to education and community centers and youth programming that actually build long-term safety and invest in our young people, um, are, those resources are being taken away. I'm here because I'm worried that um, the city of Oakland right now is wasting more than a million dollars on gang injunctions while we are cutting, um, while we don't have after-school programs and other community centers and places where young people can stay and be off the street at night and build community with each other and build long-term safety. Every meeting that I went to, I heard a citizen say, my house has been broken into, I've been robbed, I've been a victim of this. I am not used to going to a city where the majority of people have been victims of crime. That is shocking to me. Even in this room today, you listen to the residents here that say, I've been a victim of crime. That is shocking. It's unacceptable. And so what we're trying to do as, as an agency to address that, and to change that, and to impact it, is we're shifting every resource, every walking beat, everything in this organization down to patrol the black and white police vehicles. We're going to put everything that we have out there on the streets. I'm shifting two deputy chiefs to the patrol unit. Right now I have one, one deputy chief. I'm pushing another deputy chief, chief down there. We've had captains in charge of areas before. I'm putting deputy chiefs in charge of areas to free up my captains so the captains can get out on the street and drive the resources. It's because I want community engagement. I want them to be on top of these crime issues. Up here in the hills or in this area, what I've heard often is that all the police officers are always going down to the more busiest part, part, parts of the city. We should cure that by July 9th. Our new, our new reorganization, unless I get in a different direction from my bosses, July 9th we'll be rolling out with a reorganization and we're going to really push beat integrity. We're going to really push having officers up here, staying up here and patrolling up here. The, the needs that the parents have in terms of um, uh, giving their kids um, the time and quality, quality time that they need to have with their kids. I see a lot of things um, in these, these hats that I wear. And, um, and I guess what I'd like, after reading some of the priorities in the other districts, I think it's real important to get, and because I'm also very politically involved in Oakland, um, that it's important to get kids politically involved so that they can advocate, advocate for their own programs in the schools and in the city. A couple things um, that I just have uh, some notes down here is one is you know we're all trying to create programs but sometimes um, entities become like little islands and we're either duplicating things or not doing it as efficiently as we can. And I'd like to see more collaboration and communication between the nonprofits and the public sector agencies. Um, you know there's there's some things we're even doing now that's not very well known. For example you mentioned doing things with Sierra Club. Um, Parks and Rec has a cooperative agreement with East Bay Regional Parks, and every year we take kids for overnights for free um, up to Del Val. And it's under the ADA Inclusion Center, which works with disabled kids, but it's inclusive. So a, a teen who has no disability can be a mentor for a disabled kid and get a two night camping trip and learn some skills on how to be a, a, a counselor in training, possibly eventually apply for a job. We need to actually work harder on making those opportunities available. Um, and 
connecting with not just agencies outside of Oakland, but even internal agencies. Um, the Department of Human Services has an assets program where they get seniors back into the workforce. I think we're missing a huge opportunity to connect those seniors and their wealth of knowledge with apprenticeship type program where we get youth and connect them and they can learn from that, those years of experience. So I think there's a lot of ways that we actually can make more what out of was that? Department of Human Services, DHS. OPR is here too and we have, if anyone's interested in the, the camp program I mentioned, we have our a table here. But you know, we, we have to look harder at, at just, you know, when we preserve what we have, also preserving what we have and making more of what we have with what we already have in place, you know. I think there's an opportunity we haven't really tapped yet. Yeah. Sure. Is there a concern there in terms I, of I how think there does need to be better how communication. the city can better facilitate interdepartmental communication? Or? <laughs> we need to look at what we're offering and how those things interact and can mesh together and, and actually have some way of, we need to facilitate those conversations between departments and also between the the city entities and the nonprofits. So we're not both treading water with barely enough resources, but really we're doing the same thing. We, we A lot of times we'll have a resource that they don't have and they have a resource we don't have. And if we combine them together, it makes it much better. Some information you hear word of mouth, mm -hmm. and that's not, I mean, Get his After the fact, right? <laughs> you know, with the with the with the information so it's so advanced so rapidly, the technology it's kind of hard to oh, okay. understand why it's not it's no, not getting out to no. schools. Okay. So what we'd like to do is talk about keeping our libraries open, no matter which library it is. We want to keep the hours available to us, as well as staffing, and have some volunteers to supplement current city staff. Is that what we're looking at when we say volunteers? I just want to be able to get this right. I'm, I am willing to work on, um, and other people from Friends of Diamond Library, for the parcel tax to provide the maximum funding for the libraries. We used to just keep splitting the library section into two because the library is like, it's a considerable section of that. So part of it could be keeping the libraries open and the other part could be aspects of the library, keeping it accessible, keeping the hours up, keeping staffing, funding. Considering those are two main issues, why can't we bring those two together some type of way with the volunteer hours, not only from possibly staff and parents of the participants of the recreation centers, we can merge those two together and enforce more parent participation, not only in the recreation centers, but also in the libraries, which that will open children up to a whole nother avenue, not with, not with just the city of Oakland parks and recs, but to merge them too. I if we use two programs, yes, and utilize the same volume. Utilize the, the energy that's there within the community. Yeah. I'm thinking of partnerships. Oh, okay. um, uh, because, let's face it, no one person has um, all the money to do, and grant writing will only do so much. But I was planning on, since uh, ESL has been cut off the planet, mm -hmm. of this planet anyway, mm -hmm. um, using the room at Lakeview to do yes. an ESL program, and I was granted six weeks. Unfortunately, if we don't get the money, it stops week one. My mm -hmm. point is there are, there are, you don't look for one thing, you look to partnerships. Yes. And I don't know if it's grant writing, but I'd just like to throw that out there as oh, a possibility. A so you're so saying partnerships with corporate? Could be corporate, could be grant writing, could be something in the community, a okay. matching grant. I don't know. Okay. But since I hear, tr I hear changing from four lanes to two lanes with a bike lane and a turning lane. Uh, does it take care of parking? Does well, it affect parking? It, the parking would be in the, the bike lane and it wouldn't be used as much and residents could safely park in that way. Because I know I live right on 35th and I cannot tell you, I have to put my flasher on to park, <coughs> to parallel park, because um, people just speed and they come like this close to, I, I can't tell you how many times I've almost been well, there. I and I heard more um, stop signs, more cost efficient than stop lights. What else for 35th Street? And we used, we used to have a, a 
police officer that would park down the street, uh, maybe a um, couple of blocks above MacArthur, hide behind the you know, apartment, mm -hmm. and constantly give people tickets. Now they are not there anymore. They have been replaced by the light corner of things in Monterey and uh, 35th Avenue, which it does not work. No matter how fast people go, they know it doesn't blink, it doesn't take the picture of the car. So that means nothing. The city has a program where you can adopt a spot. If you, um, you know, the parks or keep Oakland clean, and um, neighbors have adopted medians. One of the things that we had to do last year is we cut all the park and median maintenance in half. And the home median and park program hasn't all cost a living increase since um, 93. So that's been particularly stretched and hard hit. Um, but it seems to me, particularly because the plants you have there are not like fast growing plants, that if we did like an adopt the spot thing with the Redwood Heights Neighborhood Association, do a different block each week, that you could probably only have to do that maybe once a year, just do the whole, whole set of it, because they're not fast growing. The Glenview made a mistake and did these really fast growing plants. They have to trim theirs about every month. Right, because they, their plants are just uh, totally out of control. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Jose Contreras. I live in the Allendale neighborhood, too, and we, ourselves as neighbors, have taken on a bus stop by Culver. Oh, right. Ice that looks very nice. Yeah. I saw that. Okay. I, that's so, blight and beautification again, very good. And um, the neighbors uh, had a meeting about it last Tuesday night about uh, uh, what they're put there without consulting us. And the thing that concerns me about it is the reason they gave for that, putting a big pole up mm -hmm. with the two, two discs on it, is it's federal funds that paid for it, and it had to be on city security property, like a police station or a fire station, because then people can keep an eye on it. Well, fire station 25, where it's put, is supposed to, one of the ones is supposed to be closed down. So there's, there's a conflict of interest there. Well, and I live on the corner, and um, my property is. Just, just, and that just, corner is the best dumping ground for everything mm -hmm. I've ever seen. I mean, it's like clothes. Bartlett and what? Um, Brookdale. Brookdale. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. your tires. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I haven't gotten tires oh. yet. <laughs> but for a while, I was collecting shoes. Oh, yeah. You know, you I, know I, I thought I would them. open a boutique. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got you. Hi, my name is Ella Silverman, and um, we live in the Laurel. And um, litter is definitely a concern for us as well, as is the increasing vacancy rate um, along MacArthur Avenue mm -hmm. and what that's doing to the lack of beautification thereof in the area. Are you talking about the stores? Commercial vacancy yeah, rate. Yeah, that's what yeah. I thought too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm with the law. Yeah. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Ro Roberto Costa, Allendale Park neighborhood. Uh, just a clarification for the blight. I think it's mostly related to public property blight issues. Just to make sure, because it is blighting private property, and that's the uh, one that the gentleman was alleging to. Oh, okay. And then the other one is the leader aspect, which is some public, public. property. So we're ah. going to be specific so we can guide the mayor and, and city council towards it. Uh, as far as my concern, um, I, I have been doing murals also, beautification projects in the area for the past three years. I am a former NCPC for Allendale Park. And uh, I would like to see something from the uh, city in terms of... Um, a small grant projects or programs uh, to, to fund some of those. I know we have been doing it on our own, uh, with our own efforts, but if we get some type of uh, motivation in the name of materials maybe, or approvals for these uh, public benefit projects, that would be great. If okay. they formalize that process, uh, that would be great. Right. One stop, right, so that would make it more efficient. Okay, and do you want it in District 4, or are you willing to travel? I think it should be citywide. Citywide. Well, okay. what about at each senior center? Which, if we had one in District 4, we could do that. Okay. Um, and then possibility in each district, in each uh, senior center. It's something I say needs to be investigated because it's brand new. I'll oh. find out. Or it could exist and we may not know about it. There is in, in, other other, in other cities. There, there is rebuilding together. They do 15 houses a year. Okay, we can write 15. Uh, rebuilding yeah. together? No. Rebuilding together is a program. Rehab's your own home. Okay. okay, I'm interested for the city to encourage the benefits of whole food, plant-based diet, which, will <coughs> which has the potential to reduce the health care costs by 70%. I would like to piggyback on the aging in place concept, and I believe 
um, that there are a tremendous number of resources that are already available, yes. but because of the lack of consistent communication that's available to the public, whether it's a consolidated website that you can get to through the city website, um, you spoke about the the care there. I mean, I'm aware of a, a, a number of facilities that are targeted low-income senior citizens, um, but it's very difficult to find what's out there. It takes a, a lot of time and effort, <laughs> and you have a lot of children caring for parents, and we're looking for resources. It's, it's terrific for the kids. Terrific for the kids, especially those that live in apartment buildings, don't have access to ground in order to see how plants thrive and grow and water and feel proud about the growth. Some kids just don't, just don't, you know, have that opportunity, except in the classroom. I know we're concerned about the uh, predatory parking enforcement, we're concerned about the business tax, you know, and the decrease in sales tax revenue. You look at the websites of other cities, they've had a dramatic increase in sales tax and business tax because Oakland succeeded in chasing them away. I think we also need to consider having a commercial tax cap. So I remember when Jerry came in, he said, come to Oakland because rents are more affordable here. After they came, rents went up dramatically. So we find a lot of people are leaving or downsizing their rental spaces because of the escalating rents on commercial spaces. So we need to have some type of incentive to get people to stay here so they can build their business. Meetings like this are incredibly powerful. <laughs> Getting this information up and into the mayor's hands is critical. It's, I've, been, I've now attended every um, town hall. Uh, very similar ideas are put out there. There's some consistency um, in, in, in everything we're hearing. That's the first thing I want to say to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for doing this. I want to introduce uh, very quickly, John Bailey runs our Workforce Investment Board. When, when you're talking about jobs, when you're talking about the first step up on the job ladder, this is the guy who runs the show on that. He's in the CETA. When you talk about small business development and retention, it's Mike McPherson. It's the Business Assistance Center. We're going to capitalize on the regional venues that we host. We host the Port of Oakland. We have hospitals in this city. Um, we have one of the best children research groups in Cory that is run by Children's Hospital. We have an international airport. We have, um, we have sports franchises. The idea is to capitalize on each and every one of those. We've gone back after baseball. Baseball is live in Oakland. Two million people coming into this city in a very specific portion of the city um, creates demand for new products and new, and, and, uh, and new businesses. Um, you may have heard recently about what I've, what I've called Coliseum City. For a hundred years, people have talked about the empty parking lots out at the Coliseum. The idea is to build a, to build a second city center out there. Large floor plate, multi-story buildings, sub-regional headquarters space for Salesforce, Microsoft, Cisco, all those guys who are down in the valley. Our problem is that we, we don't have the space to locate those guys. I'm sorry. One of the problems is we don't have the space to locate those guys. Jim Dexter from Beat 13Y and the top priorities that the public safety voted for with their three green dots were uh, budget related issues, all of them. The first one is the union uh, negotiations. We need to uh, address that in a very positive way. The second is the cost of the gang injunctions and a great deal of worry about that, and we'll see how that works out. And the third is cuts to the libraries and parks, so it's all budget related. Uh, my name is Stan Dodson. I live in the Diamond District and also manage uh, a business there, La Free Bakery. Uh, our three items were um, blight on commercial and private property, uh, also litter on public property and ways that we can uh, solve that. We clean up and education, and then also uh, we would like to see the city reinstate the small grant, keep o uh, the, the Keep Oakland Beautiful small grants, $250 to $500. Hi, I'm, I'm Steve Brown. I uh, live in Oakmore and have a daughter at Monterra. Uh, we d identified four items. That we, there are a lot of concerns, but we did try to focus on things where we thought 
city government could have an impact as opposed to sort of more general education issues. Uh, our top item was, of course, funding with a particular emphasis on art, music, uh, after school, and adult ed. Um, we, uh, we think there are a couple of, of possibilities. One is to look, a, this is more long term, but to look at a rainy day fund, much like the San Francisco School District has, and also to continue to promote the, the parcel tax and make people aware of the impact that we've all seen on the handouts today. Our, our second item, and this is a big one, and I don't think the story is out there, is forgiveness of the debt that was occurred during the time that the state was running the district here. Why should we be held accountable for that? And uh, the publicity needs to get out there. We need to make sure that the, the local media is telling the real story behind this. And we look to the city with the help of citizens here to, to lobby uh, the governor and the state, the state uh, government in general, the officials here, to, to get that taken off the debt load of the Oakland schools. I am Jose Saldona. I currently uh, attend the Division Academy of Arts and Technology, and I'm also here. In, I'm also here in order to speak for YLC, which is a youth leadership council for uh, pub Oakland Public Libraries. Um, I'm here to report the other two uh, major problems and give uh, possible solutions. Um, adult education is also one of the problems, and uh, one potential uh, solution could be uh, to use grants and rec centers for ESL programs and also putting more funding into libraries because libraries also already have, such as the Cesar Chavez uh, Branch Library, which is in Fruitvale, already has ESL program which provides uh, adults with um, <coughs> computer uh, classes and also language class. Um, and also businesses should also invest more in education, not only in adult schooling, but also for uh, children as a potential investment. Uh, the fourth problem is uh, school safety. So one solution is to get more parent volunteers and let the um, parents also become a lot more uh, into uh, the children's schooling and uh, also high school stu schooling. And uh, communication between schools is also very vital because some schools are very successful, but we want all schools of Oakland to be very successful and to thrive. So the better schools, quote unquote, should actually collaborate with those that are not so good, quote unquote. <laughs> and not only that, um, just in general, we should prioritize the fun funding so that we're thinking long term instead of short term, such as like children not suffering because of banks or because of businesses and revenues aren't coming the way how they are supposed to, right? Transportation, because everyone is a pedestrian. Um, our topic was transportation and infrastructure, and we focused on an, an, utilizing the concept of complete streets, where the design would allow for safe mobility for everyone, whether you're driving a car, riding a bicycle, or walking, that the streets would, and sidewalks and crossings would all be designed to move traffic safely. We focused as an example on 35th Avenue, okay, <laughs> which is a very wide street and it has a big problem with speeding. It's currently four lanes and the suggestion was made that if we had two traffic lanes and a bike lane with where it's appropriate having a turn lane, a left turn lane, that traffic would slow down and be safer for everyone. Um, someone mentioned about the medians, that the vegetation grows and reduces visibility, and therefore it's unsafe. One suggestion was made that volunteers join Keep Oakland Beautiful and adopt the spots along the median. And, oh, another thing, we would like to see some stop signs on 35th Avenue. Comparing it with Lincoln Avenue, which has many stop signs, and it's a narrower street. Uh, we feel that, that if we had more stop signs, 35th Avenue could be as safe as Lincoln. Okay, is that so? uh, Jill Broadhurst from Montclair. Sam Burr, resident since 1975. 
Okay. Um, what can Oakland do to give incentives to bring businesses to Oakland? Number two, jobs. We need uh, to make sure public safety is addressed to attract jobs. And third, stop scaring businesses away. For instance, we should look at how our tax structure is. Uh, Emeryville and San Leandro get businesses going there because they're, they're taxing on net rather than gross. Our tax base is different than others and we scare businesses away. We'd actually make more money if we modified how we work. And lastly, affordable housing. Hi, I'm Julie Jones, uh, Lincoln Avenue. Yeah. And uh, we talked about many things and we came up with two. We seem to uh, give our votes to two different things. And the number one was to uh, develop aging in place. And that has two dimensions. One is for seniors to live in their houses and receive care until death. And secondly, and the template for this has already been drawn up, Mayor Kwan, uh, for aging in place in, for instance, HUD-sponsored senior residential housing. You move in at 62, you live there until you die, you're constantly cared for. We'd like to see that very much. We believe it's possible in this great nation, and I'd work for it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine. I live on Aiken Drive, and I also work for the city as the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act coordinator. The two things that uh, we talked about was number one, aging in place, and number two was seniors want to be more empowered in city government, both in the allocation of resources to seniors and how that's done and how that's done in a coordinated way so that seniors know about them and can access them, and to have a really strong commission on aging that uh, advocates for seniors on every level. I'm Adele Foley, and I'm the vice chair of the Friends of Melrose Library. Um, okay, we, um, we had three items. One was libraries, keeping them open and staffed. The other, second was park programs, and the third was park maintenance. I'll be talking about libraries. Karen will be talking about the parks. For the libraries, there were really three themes. First one was funding. Uh, the parcel tax is something we've all been talking about, but our idea was to commit to working for it, even though you don't like to go door to door and you hate fundraising, to actually get out there and commit to work for it. The second theme was partnerships. Working together on grants, on programs, bringing together parks and recs and the libraries, not just keeping them separately. And the third, and this kind of almost goes together with it, is volunteers. To have a central volunteer office that could look at people willing to volunteer, what they bring to the table, what's available to them, not just for one agency, but for the entire <coughs> city. Um, and that's really what our solutions are. Uh, I'm Karen Long. Um, I am the chairperson of Friends of Diamond Library, but I also live on Diamond Park and care very much about Diamond Park and the rec center. The two um, priorities for us in the park area, as Adele mentioned, were maintaining and protecting park programs, including the pool, like Lion's Pool, and secondly, um, the maintenance of the park in keeping our parks that are safe and in good condition. Um, one suggestion was that we post our needs and concerns on neighborhood listservs for better communication about what's going on in the parks and what the needs are at the rec center and needs for maintenance. Uh, we like the idea of using volunteers. Uh, Project 22 apparently is a court order community service program for people that earn tickets and they uh, 
get rid of the tickets by working as a volunteer, for example, in the parks. And we would like to encourage the use of that, particularly for park maintenance. Uh, we understand that volunteers who work with with uh, young people have to be fingerprinted. And so there's some extra responsibilities that are involved with that. Um, and lastly, we, in terms of parks, are also willing to get out and work for the parcel tax that we think is probably the best solution for the protection and the maintenance of our parks. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Daniel Swafford, and I was joined in facilitation by Jamila Lawson and uh, Linda Overos. Uh, you could say that the big picture that came out of our discussion was a need to engage our young people. Step out of your comfort zone if you have to, but, but listen to their interests. Participate in their lives. Uh, try to build their networks and introduce them to opportunities. Asking for additional services is not enough. We have to serve our young people in the city of Oakland. Yeah, yeah what do you say? That's a challenge that we can all accept, I think. Uh, I'll let uh, Linda introduce the uh, priorities as we voted on in the, in the group session. Okay, um, my name's Linda Olvera and I'm from the Montclair District, but I work with uh, youth educationally and recreationally in the city of Oakland. Um, one, of the, one of the main things that came out of our meeting was that we already have a lot of programs for youth. Needless to, needless to say, we need to maintain those programs and we need more programs, but there's the problem of revenue. So a lot of the emphasis was that youth need to get involved themselves. And there's a great program that we learned from one lady, one student in our, in our uh, workshop. Her name is Jamila Lawson, and she's from District 6. And she uh, is organizing youth through the block by block network that her mother belongs to and is active in. And she strongly believes that the youth have to get involved, and the youth relate to each other. It's hard for adults to bring in the youth and organize, but they're doing it in their district. And she said that she's, they're even having a meeting with uh, Chief Bates uh, to talk about the, the different programs, that more programs for youth in, the, in, the, in their community. And so that was the emphasis to organize youth. And I just think that's great that we have a group like that in Oakland to start the ball rolling. Uh, and the other one was maintaining the, to maintain the existing youth programs, the after school, and to make sure that once they're started, they're maintained and they stay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the things we talked about in preparedness was the uh, core program, communities of Oakland responding to emergencies, how we can internet this, interlink this through uh, schools, churches, and neighborhoods. Uh, also, how do we get our neighborhoods involved? And we don't want them to be, be the spontaneous volunteers during a disaster, but actually be involved. Uh, the other thing we touched on was the need for the city of Oakland to put out the information on the 911 registry for our senior citizens and people with disabilities. Uh, a lot of it was covered in the uh, police and public safety forum, so I want to get into that. Thank you. Uh, so again, I'm Joe DeVries with the Neighborhood Services Division. Um, out front, we have a map and Felicia Verdon, uh, Felicia stand up, she and I will be out there at the end of this. If you don't belong to your neighborhood council and you want to know when it is, I've got the list of all of them and we've got the map to figure out where it is. If you already belong to your neighborhood council, you need to get to know your neighbors and get them to the meetings. Uh, this is really, you know, I said it earlier, Neighborhoods are safer when neighbors know each other, and that means knowing the kids on your block, knowing the seniors on your block who might have a medical emergency in case of a disaster. You know, getting to know your neighbors is really, you know, the city can't do it all. So it's one thing to complain about trash, it's another thing to pick trash up. It's one thing to complain about kids hanging out and not going to school, it's another thing to engage with them and their parents and, and get them to school. And really that's what Neighborhood Watch and Neighborhood Councils, it's not just about crime, it's really about getting to know your neighborhood. So please, if you don't belong to your council and you wanna know when it meets, come meet us at the table out front. 
Uh, if you're already involved in your council, God bless you. Thank you so much. And um, keep up the good work and, and get to know your neighbors, really. That's, that's really it. So come visit me at the map. Thanks. We have three options on the budget. And so I hear I was criticized while I was in China for quote unquote not giving the budget um, detail. This is actually three budgets. And the reason it's three budgets is because I can't control some of the factors. Um, and this is, if you look at your pyramid, this is only the bottom part of the pyramid. There can be additional cuts. So for instance, we think we've beaten back our former mayor, uh, Governor Brown, on taking away our redevelopment funds. But um, should we lose redevelopment funds, that could be about $25 million. Um, and we use redevelopment for everything in this city. Huh? I don't know. This some lady said she needed more. Are there any out there? Can people get them? OK. so. Um, so you can read, so I'm not going to go over, but I wanted to point out that what we're talking about is the base of the, of the triangle here. Um, there's some, some things I don't control at all. So for instance, the city council, I've been trying to get the city council to make a um, decision on how we're going to handle the old uh, police officers pension fund and firefighters pension fund. Now, this was founded in 1955. It wasn't well funded and conceived of. They've tried to fix it three times um, in history. I'm now on the third. Um, and um, it was tried to, tried to fix it in the 70s and twice in the 70s and you know, once right after it was founded at the end of the 50s. Then in the 70s, uh, we did a holding action about four years ago. But basically, um, um, it needs to be funded and what I'm recommending is to take some of the surplus funding um, because we've, we've, in the good years of the stock market, we developed an increment <clears throat> that we're ahead of schedule to take that excess money invested and bond this out a, another uh, 20 years. Um, there are some people who insist I fix it this year, haven't fixed it for the last 20 years. Fixing it in the middle of a recession would mean that we'd have to cut another $40 million out of the budget. Now I know some people think government should be smaller and I should just do that, but quite frankly it seems that most of you still want your libraries and your parks, so um, I don't think we're going to do that. Some people want us to delay that. And and every month that I delay it, there's less capital money available to bond out. And so what does it mean the difference is the difference between bonding out and um, having a slightly um, a longer period of time to, to pay it off, like a mortgage, and not having to make uh, massive cuts in the next five years. Now, I'm recommending a version where we pay $5 million down a year to get some of the principal down, but um, the city council might want to consider taking a five-year holiday and then starting to pay five years from now when some of our other bonds will be paid off and therefore there's less money to pay. Um, it's None of it's a good solution. This is a long-term thing that started when I was five years old, um, and, and we just need to, 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 uh, to deal with it. Um, the next part of that triangle is the, the redevelopment and the state cuts. Um, whatever we do, we're going to get some impact by the state, either directly for our budget. I have not had a chance to study what I understood just came out of, of the assembly last night, um, but I will and put it in my newsletter. Um, but they're likely to have some cuts uh, um, and then there's a compromise probably around redevelopment. Some people are saying, why do I spend time? Uh, one gentleman asked me why I'm spending time on statewide organizations like the League of Cities, because the League of Cities are the, are the, is, and the Big Ten mayors are the ones who, who led that fought, fight to, to keep redevelopment and I played a key role on that as a member of the steering committee. And so, um, it looks like we'll have a compromise. What it means is that we'll pass through more money to the schools and have a slightly less money in redevelopment. That's a compromise I actually offered the governor the very first time I went to Sacramento on that, and it looks like that's what's going to happen. Um, but we're still hopeful that that will happen, and we won't lose all of these millions of dollars that we use for affordable housing. We use 25% of that money for affordable housing. And plus, we have a lot of debt on, on what we invested in Uptown. And, and so um, 
It's also what we would use to build the retail center um, on Broadway. Those kinds of funds you use, it's like a mortgage, you borrow the money, you invest, and then it helps pay off by increased property taxes, the money that you, you uh, borrow. So I always give this example. After Loma Prieta, downtown was almost dead. About half the buildings had been badly damaged. Some of them had to be torn down. Others had, we had to put millions of dollars in retrofit. Had we not done that, we wouldn't have the successful uptown that we have today. The Fox Theater was the last of those major renovations. And today, it's the hottest, the New York Times calls it the hottest restaurant scene in the East Bay. It is ahead of schedule on payments because the tax increments of the va increased value of property taxes have increased so rapidly that we're actually ahead of schedule in paying that back. So that's what redevelopment's about. Um, but there will probably be other cuts. And if Jerry releases um, more people from the prisons, and it can be done, so it's not a thing that I'm really totally scared of, it's a question of how he does it. I have to tell you that when I went to Detroit, that they have a program where they work it like an HMO. They turn particularly young offenders over to community groups, and they are highly incentivized to keep those kids straight and in school, otherwise they have to pay for the incarceration costs. They have an 18% recidivism. We have an 80% recidivism, and our cost of locking kids up in prison is more than I spent sending my kid to Princeton. So think about that. All right, all right. Um, then the last area that we're not, uh, not totally sure about is the, what's going to happen with the feds. Um, they're going after CDBG, and oh, that's the community block grant, and a lot of our senior parent programs are paid for that. Um, a lot of our um, help for the schools, that, and these are all controlled by neighborhood groups. Some of you, Preston was here earlier, have been on the CDBG groups where you vote to how that money is spent. They're very little grants, but they're very well used. The crossing guard here at Bret Hart used to be paid for with a, with a block grant, because people vote, what is it that will help their neighborhood? Um, Head Start is on the chopping block. Oakland has a high percentage of preschool programs, and it really makes a difference for kids in terms of an equal start. And um, between the school district, which got really hard hit uh, uh, in terms of their funding, and if Head Start were to go again, it'd be just that much tougher for our kids to have an equal chance. Um, the other thing that would probably be eliminated is the senior-funded uh, federal programs. So that's the potential of additional cuts and it is so deep, if you added that all up, it'd be over $100 million if all the worst to happen. Now, we're thinking redevelopment won't happen now, but that's how bad it is. So how much expendable fund do I have as the city council? We have about $100 million. So we'd, if all those things, and obviously it's not a parallel, but it means that we have less options to what we can do, and that's why even last year, we laid off police officers for the first time. We didn't think we would. We thought that the police, the OPOA, um, would pay 9% just as the Highway Patrol did, and just as San Francisco did, and just as San Jose. In fact, San Jose is now at 12% pay into their pension. Um, and San Francisco is looking at a change because it's a, a pretty good pension. And I think our police officers deserve it. It's just that we have to share the cost uh, of funding it, and that's, that's one of the problems. Um, our, our, our police officers union didn't take it even to a vote to its membership, and so we ended up laying off officers. Well, I've decided that I'm not doing that, and then we have to fight them legally. But um, I would rather see everybody furloughed, including the public safety officers, and we would do it on a vacation basis that people would choose those days, because you can't close all. Right now, the way the format we're using is we close down the city. Well, I'm recommending that we do it on a vacation basis for everyone, that kind of format where people choose their furlough days, and that way we can and keep more of our institutions open. And that way, everybody can participate. Because it's not fair for the lower paid people, and they are with the more like the clerical people at City Hall, et cetera, for them to be furloughed, and then other people not have, have to participate. And so what we're, where we're at is, is that we're asking our employees across the board to give back 10% in any way they want. A pension, uh, pay, furlough days, et cetera. And um, 
as I said, I was optimistic and hopeful because both police and fire whose contracts are not up are in negotiations with us. So I'm somewhat hopeful that will happen. I need that. We also need to make some cuts. So even under the base, best case scenario, we'll lose 104 full-time equivalents. Now, about 30 of those will be museum people. If the uh, the city council agrees to have the museum foundation run that, and most of those people will probably be offered job will be offered jobs by the foundation. But it's still under the best case scenario, about 70 people will lose their jobs permanently. All right. If we get, and that's if you vote for the parcel tax, which is a quarter a day. And one of the ifs and is and why major the option C is still up in the air is that the city council has to vote to have that election and many of you are here to say that people the city council needs to let the, the voters here decide whether or not you want to do that or not if not the best case scenario is going to be B just employee contributions what I had originally hoped is that we would have had the parcel tax on the mail ballot uh, why because now under the current timeline because we have to give so many days we will no matter what happens on July 1st we will lay off people 162 people minimum and we will um, uh, probably have to close some programs because we won't know even if a parcel tax is approved this week we won't know until August or September and so we'll have to go that many months is one of the reasons I thought it was urgent and that we should have done it because I think you lose, first of all, it's not fair to our employees and that you lose something when you lay off people and you close down programs and you have to start them up again. So that's sort of where we are right now. The worst case scenario, um, that is, so this is assuming major B, the uh, option B assumes that we get 10% from all our employees or about very close to 10% from our employees. Um, scenario A assumes no parcel tax or we lose the parcel tax and employees don't give any contributions at all. Um, I'm assuming that we'll at least get back the furlough days, so it's unlikely that the worst case will happen, and that will be somewhere between A and B under the worst case scenario. Um, but we'll see. Um, you know, a lot of my other union members feel that because police and fire, uh, well, police actually, fire did, but because police didn't give, that they're not giving until they see if the police give. And this is sort of like we're all holding each other hostage. Um, and I think. What I'm saying is the only way we get out of the recession is that we all give, and that's what I'm asking people to, to support the budget seat. So I'm going to leave it at that, and I'm going to do the drawing for the kids, and then and we're going to open it up. So, Well, when council member, when uh, Mayor Kwan was council member in District 4, she was able to sec secure PAGO funds so that we can start an innovative, fresh, and creative teen program. And it's called Oakland Young Entrepreneur Project. And with that, we purchased a silkscreen machine, and now Oakland youth that are creative and talented can come learn how to start and run their own business. And these are two of our students that will present Mayor Kwan. Uh, hi, my name is Mario. Um, I'm one of the artists from, from the program at Allendale Recreation Center. That's where we're doing our silk screening. And as an artist, like, it's pretty cool seeing my designs come to life and in shirts or wherever. Um, my part in the silk screening is um, to the um, what is it? public is is um, public relations. So I'm the one that's in charge of all that little money and not money, but like numbers. Um, uh, my name's Lily, and mine's like office, so I'm learning all the office stuff, and it's gonna help me later on if I want to make my own business. And we want to present to her a uh, original design we made for her. It says, One Oak City and Allendale protecting our community.
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and it's a reusable bag, no plastic bags, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, let's take the first question, Reverend. I want to know why the city, when offered money from the casinos, refused to take it, and in fact, they have not used the army base uh, as they could use to generate revenue for the city of Oakland, whereas we have, uh, as in my studies and talking to uh, some of the uh, tribes, which I happen to be a member of one of, the, of a tribe, that uh, you have not taken advantage of this, and you can get 10 to 15 to 20 million a year from casinos to go into uh, programs for youth, programs for seniors, programs for fire, programs for the police. By the way, uh, firemen, you get to raise. Police, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, one more thing, one more thing. Uh, who runs the city? The city council and the mayor, or like a police officer told me, you have nothing to do with them. So um, that's an old fight. Um, Indian casinos, I think Jerry wanted to put them in the middle of where the port's going to be. Uh, the port, and the question is, is whether or not Oakland was going to maintain its industrial base and whether or not we were going to maintain the port. And that's high paying blue collar jobs versus casinos, which are low paying service jobs. Um, I helped lead the movement to stop the casino. And the, its reason is, is I looked really carefully at what happened to cities, Atlantic City, for example, and uh, which is a better example than Las Vegas of what happened to their economy. What tends to happen is when you have a casino is that people's expendable income goes to gambling and that you have higher rates of suicide, crime, et cetera, et cetera, and the jobs created are pretty low uh, level service levels. And because of how the casinos are set up, most of the profits go to the people who own the machines in Las Vegas uh, and not back into the community. So right when I was in China, I was trying to sell uh, the area where the other casino would have been. Uh, so one was going to be in the middle of the port and it would have stopped our modernizing and keeping us to be one of the most modern containerized ports in, in the West Coast. And the other one was going to be in the heart, right next to the beautiful uh, marsh that we've re resurrected. In the heart of what we're hoping to sell as either um, a high-tech business park um, and or a um, international business park because it's right next to the airport. It would be part of what the uh, economic development people have called uh, uh, Coliseum City, uh, where we think we can develop uh, a lot of uh, basically white collar and or science jobs. Mike, if you want to say. I'll respond to your other question about who runs the city. The mayor actually runs the city. She's the boss of all, she's the boss of the city administrator, who's the boss of all the department heads, who are the bosses of all of the city workers. The council is, it's, so it's kind of like the president of the United States and Congress. So I'm on Congress, she's the president. So the, the council, we're the policy makers. The biggest res, kind of responsibility we have though is passing the budget. So the mayor proposes the budget, but at the end of the day, the council is actually the body that votes to approve the budget. And in the unlikely event that there's a 4-4 split tie, um, in which case the mayor does get to have a vote, uh, only the council will actually vote on the final budget, and we are the only ones that vote on policies. Does that make sense? It's obviously a, a, a system that's being reinvented, because it's a strong mayor, but maybe not that strong for some people, too strong for other people. Mike. That's a good civics lesson. I, I'm Mike Petaha from Montclair. Uh, let me say that uh, on the positive side, I think the most important thing and the most positive thing about this really severe budget crunch is that it has brought the unions to the table. And I say that having served three terms on the Oakland Budget Advisory Commission and observed us having made some sweetheart deals at the top of the dot-com boom and the real estate boom that were not sustainable then and they aren't now. We finally have brought folks to the table. And let me say that's really important, and we need to support the city and the mayor in this negotiation because we, we all pay into our retirement funds. We're now considering that, and, and the degree to which we can do that is really important. 
And let me say in our minds, we sometimes su associate public safety with the police and fire unions. The financial interest in the public safety may be different. The police union fought for years the ability of the chief to assign when the officers work. We have more crime on Friday and Saturday than any other days. The union fought the chief's ability to, to assign them on the days when we're paying for all these officers. Other things like workman's comp, which is statistically different for Oakland oh, and other minute, cities. Mike. We're paying for a lot of money. I, I'm making a comment. We're paying for a lot of money, but not getting officers on the street. I would even say we need to look at, we assume that more officers mean more public safety. In the discussion, Chief Batts said, well, let's t look at 15 years of data for number of officers and, and correlation with crime rates. There is some correlation sometimes, but is there stronger correlation with money we could spend on economic development for jobs and parks and those sort of things which reduce crime in the long run? I think that this budget crisis really gives us an opportunity to look deeply at those fundamental okay, issues. Okay, Mike, you have a question? No. All right. I thought Thank it was you. A All right. That's it. All right. One minute, please. Um, I do want to clear up one thing. My name is Millie Cleveland. I live in District 4 in the lower part of uh, District 4. Uh, Allendale. There, you live in the Allendale. In the Allendale District. Uh, there's a constant reference to unions needing to give back. I need to clear up for people that the overall city workers that are governed by SEIU, Local 21, and some other unions have been on furloughs for the last couple of years and they do contribute to your purse. So when you talk about unions, it's important to understand that the city workers have been sacrificing and giving back for years. My question is that one of the things in our charter is a section that forbids the displacement of permanent employees with privatization and outside contractors. I would like, it's charter section 902 subsection E. I would like to know when are the budget discussions going to include discussion about the excessive costs that we are paying for outside developers for work that our workers already do. In other words, if your money is cut back at home, you don't continue to pay somebody else to cut your grass, you cut it yourself. So my question is, when are the budget discussions going to include an analysis of the outside contractors especially with the fact that it is a violation of the charter to even have them when city workers are laid off. Thank you, Millie. And Millie, okay, I'm also a former SEIU organizer. Um, I've offered the union an opportunity to bring me every contract that is in dispute that they think is contracting out, and we'll talk about it. And so far, over the last two years, only two have been brought to me. And so you can bring it anytime. You can make an appointment with me anytime. I have an open door. I have nothing to hide in this process. Um, it is, you know, it is very, very tough. Where the city does use most of its contracting out has been on what we thought would be one-time projects. So a lot of the work around the lake, DD, um, has been done because we don't have necessary people who build uh, that kind of pathway or build sways or whatever uh, is contracted out. And um, it's not something that we could do in-house. But I have to tell you, if we have to go this far down in layoffs, I have been asking, and Vic is here, I asked Vic um, from Public Works, what is it that we could have our own employees do on future bond measures like DD, although that work is almost done, so that we can keep as many city workers working uh, during this tough time. Uh, Mayor, even though it's only one-time projects. Mayor Quad, with all due respect, we have excessive number of outside contractors. We have contractors doing paving. We have contractors doing gardener, electrical work. So, we have so, all kind of contracts so, so, that are so, not one-time So, so Millie, Millie, we haven't had the conversation for long, and, and I'm trying to be quick so that we can go. If you guys provide me a list of the projects where we're using outside contractors, we haven't already contracted out on, based on a project basis, then I'd be, Vic and I would be happy to work with you on those. I, I just need something in writing. I've heard people say this, but if you don't give it to me in writing, we're really getting close. We've only got two months to go. I need specific projects, specific jobs, and trust me, I work really late at night. I'll work on it. Michael. Good afternoon. Michael Siegel, a new resident of Redwood Heights. Uh, I want to address my comment mainly to the, the Councilwoman Schaff, who has control of the purse of Oakland. Um, I have a proposal to save a million dollars, and it's to cut the gang injunction program. 
And the premise of my comment is that uh, civil lawsuits are not going to reduce crime, and civil lawsuits are not going to improve public safety. Um, earlier, we had some commentary regarding, is it really a million dollars this costs us? And what we're doing is we're diverting a lot of OPD time. We have police officers writing affidavits for a civil lawsuit instead of solving crimes. We have city attorneys who are working on this lawsuit instead of preventing foreclosures and doing other useful things. And we have three outside law firms that have over 100,000 in contracts. And so I would like to consider that you cut this program in future years until we have a proven, effective model for how we're going to do, reduce crime. Thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know, this issue is coming to the city council, the very next city council meeting that we're having this coming Tuesday. And so I will be you know, reading all the material that's presented to me. And Michael, please feel free to email me information in the email. I do want to make a distinction, though, because um, I, I don't call what Oakland is doing a gang injunction. Um, gang injunctions have been used in other cities. I think that they violate civil rights. I think they're overly broad and have a lot of room for uh, profiling and discrimination. But what Oakland is doing is what I call a neighborhood protective order, where there are named adults with criminal records who are having restrictions put on them. And these named adults have their day in court. They do have due process. And there's a big distinction between what Oakland is doing and what is generally called a gang injunction. So to the extent that I make my decision, it definitely is around what Oakland is doing and not what is generally called a gang in injunction, which is quite different and I do not support. Alan. My name is Alan Brill, and I'm uh, active in organizations involved in the health community, the education community, as well as the Block by Block Organizing Network. And um, none of us, I don't like parcel taxes. And I don't think anybody here in the room likes parcel taxes. Uh, the issue is, is that until we're able to tax the wealth that's in our communities, that's in this state, and get funding for the vital programs that we need, we're in a state of emergency, and we need to figure out a way out of it this year, this month, right now. And so my concern is, is that uh, many of us spend a few dollars a day because we consider it urgent that we have our cup of coffee every morning. And most of us feel that it's crucial that we have the ability to vote on a parcel tax to, if necessary, in order to stem the tide and stop the kind of closures that are so drastically slated. So uh, I just wanted to speak, I think I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of people here. Could people who believe that we should be able to decide as voters please stand up? Um, I, I, think, I think there are a lot of us here, and what we're saying is we want a chance to make a decision on this matter and we would like to know why this has been a problem getting it going. <laughs> I think this question is directed to me because the, the mayor's been very clear about her position on the parcel tax and uh, at the end of the day the city council is the one that, that gets the vote. But I just want to be clear there are two votes that we're being asked to make. And the first one is whether or not to declare a special election. A special election is going to cost us nearly $1 million in a year where we have very little money. And so one of my calculations that I'm trying to make is, if, and again, I have said this publicly in the past, if we were talking about putting a parcel tax on a regularly scheduled election, I would definitely let the voters decide. But that's not the question that's in front of us. The question is, should we gamble a $1 million of unbudgeted money to ask that question one year earlier. So we have a regular election next year, and the question is should we gamble a million dollars to ask the question a year earlier? And that, that is what I am grappling with, because there were taxes on the last ballot, and you know I just ran for city council. I was the only candidate in my race who actually supported all of the tax measures in the November ballot. So I obviously don't have a problem with taxes per se. But they all failed. They all went down pretty, pretty de decisively. That wasn't a tax. The Measure Y fix was not a tax. It wasn't a tax. Well, it, it was in the sense that if we hadn't voted for it, we couldn't have collected it. It wasn't a tax. It was, it was modifying a provision 
a condition to our collecting a tax that people were already paying. So, and again, I, I know there are a lot of good arguments on both sides. I'm definitely listening to them. Um, I have taken a pretty firm position that to the extent the city council makes a vote on this, I don't think that we should violate our public noticing laws, that, the, that this is a really important issue and that the public definitely has the right to be noticed. We are going to hear the issue of whether and when and how to schedule the discussion of placing a parcel tax on the ballot this Tuesday. I also want to say that when the matter has been brought to be properly uh, scheduled and agendized, I was the only member of the Rules Committee that actually voted to send the issue to the council. I was outvoted, but I did vote to schedule it when it was brought properly. So I do think it's a conversation that the whole council should have, but this is what I'm grappling with, whether we should gamble a million dollars to ask the question one year early. I do also want to make clear, you know, somebody asked me out in the hallway, which, which budget do you support, A, B, or C? And I'm like, it's so not that easy. <laughs> you know? um, Budgets, we, we cannot, as part of the budget process, pass a budget that has the parcel tax in it. We have to, by law, pass a balanced budget. So we can't pass a budget that relies on two-thirds of the voters voting to tax themselves. We can put it on the ballot. We can make that decision before we pass the budget, although, frankly, I hope we do it after we pass the budget because then you as voters are going to have a very clear idea of what you'll be getting for that parcel tax. Until we finish our budget, until uh, union negotiations are completed, we will not know exactly what we're going to put on the budget. And I think you as voters deserve to know what's the difference, what do you get for this, this tax. Um, so, you know, in a perfect way. The, the other part of you know budgets A, B, and C, budget B relies on labor negotiations being completed. Um, and again, that's something the council doesn't have power over. I'm so excited that all of our unions, and particularly police and fire, who they are in closed contracts, but they're at the table now, um, that we're having these conversations. We you know have gotten assurances that we're, we're going to have some cl clarity by the time we pass the budget, because uh, Again, we cannot put the t parcel tax into the budget, but we can, if the, the contracts are agreed on, we can put those employee concessions into the budget, adopt budget B, which at the very least preserves our library system as it is today, preserves our neighborhood service coordinators are the, as they are today. It does make other painful cuts, but it's a start. Then I think we can have a more informed discussion about the parcel tax. We, we obviously have different views on this, so let me be very clear. An election in this city will cost us at least $800,000, whether it's on a regular election or if it's a special election, will only cost us a little bit more for a special election. And if they delay it, and if Jerry gets his fall election, we can make it coincide with the special election that Jerry is trying to get, and it would be basically no difference. It will cost us more than a million dollars to close down these facilities and reopen them. We will probably lose more than a million dollars with a talent if I have to lay off 400 people and then try to rehire them six months or maybe one year later. So I think that this is one where Libby and I just disagree. It's a false economy. It's a $200,000 difference between a special election and a regular election. And trust me, just my recruitment and personnel cost of laying people off and bringing them back is going to be much more than a couple hundred thousand dollars. Much more importantly is how our staff feels. I mean, I was in a school district where every year, according to state law, we had to give a March 15th notice. And every year we lost some of our best and brightest teachers. So I always try not to lay off people if I don't have to do that because we'd always lose some people during that time when we laid them off. Now I have no choice. No matter what happens, and if the parcel tax, I mean, if we lose the parcel tax, then the people are laid off and they'll be laid off. But if we win the parcel tax, I'll be trying to rehire people that I had to lay off, I think, somewhat unnecessarily. And um, that's the, the real heart of this thing. And in terms of negotiations, part of what makes negotiations 
work is that people feel everybody's chipping in, especially the police. The police are looking at the staffing level. So they want to know that there's a chance that there's going to be this parcel tax. And the reality is that everyone's going to know this budget before we vote. Right? We're going to have a budget by March 15th, so everyone's going to know that. What we don't know is whether or not we're going to have the parcel tax. And that's what we need to have, I think, for some of the unions to give, to be honest with you, that you know, uh, one of the big issues with OPOA is, well, what's the staffing level going to be? Why should we give anything if the staffing level is just going to go down? So it works both ways. It's complicated. Uh, Libby has her feelings. She feels the way she feels for her reasons. I have my feelings, and that's why I said this is a room in this meeting and this forum to disagree. Um, but you have to think about that. You have to weigh that. Um, so. Uh, that's that's just sort of where 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 I'm at. I, I tried to do it, and, and yes, on the budget, of course, we've always passed budgets with add-on should things happen. And I will encourage the city council to do a budget that. What if the economy comes up? The economy might come up, and that you could have one or two million dollars. I'll ask them to do their two-year budget and prioritize so that the city the mayor and the administration then can plan if we look and we see tax revenues come up. Let's say if there's a small rebound in retail or a small rebound in real estate. This is a town where occasionally we get a multi-million dollar real estate sale and that generates a few million dollars in real estate taxes. Then we'll want to know what to bring back. So whatever version of the budget, it's going to be something in between A, B, and C. The city council is going to have to prioritize what to bring back. And so if it's B, and obviously it will be, the best case scenario will be B, we'll want to know should the parcel tax pass what the city council will bring back, or, and then we'll use that same prioritization so if the economy brings up. Cesar, I'm sorry, it, did I remember your name wrong? I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> Hello? Hello and good afternoon. I'm Jose Saldona and I'm a member of the Youth Leadership Council for Open Public Libraries. Um, I'm not against making cuts, but I'm disappointed that the libraries are receiving one of the biggest financial blows. Four out of 18 library branches would remain if Proposition A would get passed, as I'm sure that you would know. <clears throat> Cesar Chavez will be closed down, as well as Melrose would be closed down. And I feel backstabbed that libraries and school budgets are being cut while, there are, while there's a dispute on funding gang junctions. Is that where the money should go? $200,000 on just the prosecution of every month of the funds going towards gang junctions. With another $50,000, it could possibly uh, fund Melrose for about a whole entire year. I can't speak on behalf of every teenager in Oakland. However, I can tell you how I personally feel. If we Game could try to keep you to a minute though, all right? Because we're already over time and you have six people behind you. I'm sorry, I'm almost done. <laughs> uh, gang junctions and juvies are super superficial ways for the community to feel safe, whereas education and programs from both schools and libraries could provide permanent solutions. To fix the problem, I think that we should ask for the state for forgiveness um, in terms of budget, collect money from banks by the law of SB 1137, protect measure Q, and decrease uh, the partial uh, tax possibility from $80 to $60. Okay, thank you. Let me start with the last one. On those school district, um, I asked Sandra Swanson um, way before I became mayor to do legislation that would roll back the indebtedness that was incurred by the school district during the takeover. Nearly $60 million was um, incurred by the state administrator. We're more in debt than when we were taken over. Um, when I was ahead of the National School Board Council, we had a principle that state takeover should not do any harm, should not leave the schools in worse shape, in this case it did in Oakland. Then on top of that, to add insult to injury, they were gonna fine us 23, 27 million dollars for mismanagement during the trusteeship. And we met with Tom Torlickson and have rolled that back. And if you notice know recently, the school district called back some teachers took off some layoff notices. That's because the states agreed that we shouldn't have to pay fines incurred by their trustees during the state takeover. So um, that is, uh, to me, amazing. Um, very quickly on the library, why it's so 
difficult is because of Measure Q. When we wrote Measure Q, we promised the citizens that we would keep library funding at a certain level. And quite honestly, I never thought, I never foresaw a crisis this bad. You know, this is like the worst recession since the Depression. And I thought we'd never get to the point where we'd get below the $9 million funding. But if we have no employee concessions and if we don't have a parcel tax, we will not even be able to maintain the $9 million base funding for the library will come below where we were eight years ago. And the minute we're a dollar below that $9 million funding, we lose Measure Q. That's why we did the Measure Y fix, if you remember. And again, I disagree with Libby. If you had not approved that, we would have saved 60 or $80 a, a year. So it was an issue of how much taxes, but people agreed that it was worth it to keep it, and, and, and that was uh, something that did pass. So, oh, can I just give a quick response? I'm committed to keeping all the libraries open re without a parcel tax, okay? The difference is $5.2 million. That is the difference between s budget A and budget B for library funds, general funds. And so, and, and I hope if you read, if you read actually Mayor Kwan's proposed budget, in her proposal, a parcel tax has no effect on the library's budget. Now, that is because she assumes that we will get 10% contributions from all of the employee unions, and we know that that is not a done deal. So it's not to say that if, if that doesn't happen, you wouldn't look to fund library services with a parcel tax. But her budget shows that we do not need a parcel tax to keep all of our libraries open. And even if we don't get any concessions at all, we would need to fi find $5.2 million a year to keep our libraries functioning as they are today. So I'm committed to finding that, and um, I, I just can't tell you how much I value what the libraries do in our community. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. My name is, also, my name is Rafiwe, and I'm also a member of the Youth Leadership Council of the Library. And my question is to... Council Member Shaft, of what you already talked a little about, a little bit about this, of what you plan to do to make sure that all the libraries don't close, because I need me and a lot of other teenagers that don't have the resources at home to keep up with their schoolwork, especially because in the 21st century you need a lot of technology to be able to do a lot of the work they require at school, like a computer. I don't have a computer at home, but I have to constantly do research. I need to use my email and I need to do, do essays, but if you close the libraries, and especially the Diamond Branch is already a crowded library, and it's difficult already to get to the computers and the resources there, and if the libraries around it are closed, then it's gonna be even more crowded, and I wanted to know what you were gonna do to avoid that. I think I responded. It's, yeah. you know. <laughs> Thanks. Right. And let me just add one thing. The problem with our general fund is half the budget goes to the police. Um, and so it's, and what I decided to do, and then that's why the assumptions, I want to tell you what the assumptions are. My assumptions were is that we'd make it a, a, about a 15% cut across departments, except for police and seniors. For the police, it's a little less. And for seniors, um, if we get any money at all, we'll restore all the senior programs, mostly because they've been so hard hit by the state and federal. And so that's my assumption. So I didn't assume that I could take money from other places. So that meant the libraries would take the same amount. Now obviously in real world that didn't balance to get the major Q funds, they may want to do that. But I tried to lay out an equitable scenario and that's why I really say the only scenario is for everyone to contribute. The employees to contribute, the voters to contribute, and for me in addition to that make additional cuts. And that by only that doing that together that I think we can get through this fairly. Uh, my name is Courtney Tran. I'm another member of the Youth Leadership Council of the Oakland Public Libraries, and I do realize that you've already responded to this question, but I'd just like to emphasize the same point. I'm a high schooler living in Fruitvale, so earlier the Youth Empowerment Group spokespeople emphasized the importance of youth empowerment programs. 
They stated that once such programs are started, it's important that they be maintained and they stay. And I can personally attest to that because I'm, as a member of the Youth Leadership Council, I've gotten exposure to things like this. I've gotten exposure to more public speaking, running events, and if the libraries are cut, the Youth Leadership Council gets cut as well. And um, libraries, as I'm sure you already know, are culture centers, safe social centers, gatherings of educational resources, volunteer and job opportunities and information. And yes, the budget is a monster of a problem to be grappling with. And what I'm absolutely sure, though, is that closing 14 out of the 18 existing libraries is not the acceptable solution. And if Prop A goes through, these libraries, which are already crowded and already short on funding and already struggling, will be absolutely done in. And the budget is certainly the problem, but I believe that budget A is certainly not the answer. I know that you've already responded to this question once or twice, but I'd really just like to emphasize that point. Thanks. I just want to say that all of you are really impressive public speakers. <laughs> and uh, if you'd ever like for me, I. I um, to, to, I really would enjoy an opportunity to come meet with your leadership council. It would be fun to explain the budget process and talk to you about other ways that you can ha you know, have your voice heard by the city council and by your leadership. It would be great. I, I, I'd love to help, help you I'm do that. I'm their coordinator and we meet every third Saturday of the month at the main branch of the Oakland Public Library in the Teen Zone. Okay. <laughs> I'm Carol Lonergan. I'm a resident of 22X. Um, I'm on the NCPC uh, board uh, steering committee. I'm also on the safety and crime committee. When Jean was um, uh, our council member, and now as Libby is our council member, I was very, very disappointed in our breakout session for crime and safety because we we didn't get anything accomplished. It was seemed that the meeting was co-opted by a lot of people who were in the audience who wanted to address the gang injunction issue and they've left because they had nothing yeah. just, just talk to us sorry uh, and so we the, the things we we were supposed to vote on three priorities and there were so many people that came and it was like they were planted there to put all the dots on the gang injunction and the, and the, and that sort of thing so the things that I thought were going to be addressed and, and that many people that I have spoken to thought would be addressed were not addressed and so I'm, I was very disappointed about that and that's, you know, that's what I have to say. Thank you. We're going to have follow-up meetings and we'll announce for every district so that um, a lot of the people who are on the gang junctions actually do live in the district. I recognize enough faces. This is an issue that split the community. And is, since I wasn't asked directly, let me just quickly say, where I stand on the injunctions is the, the chief um, was here, and he knows that um, we use injunctions in the Laurel to get rid of some young men who were mugging ladies who were shopping at Lucky's. Um, so I don't have anything against injunctions in general. I think it could have done, been done much better, and so the chief agrees with me. I don't think you need the call gang injunctions if you have particular individuals who are mugging people in particular neighborhoods you just need to do it I think it was done as a way to quite frankly showboat a little bit and as a result it's also stigmatized the community I can't tell you how many emails I got from people who you know because the the real estate brokers sometimes feel they have to report this kind of thing, that there's a gang injunction in your neighborhood. So people who are homeowners who are trying to sell their homes weren't particularly happy either that it was 120 blocks the entire fruit fail. And that sort of is also what made some people in the Hispanic community feel that it was nobody else had 120 blocks in their injunction that encompassed their whole community. So I don't think it was done well. Um, and. I'd like to be able to resolve this in a way that does not cost me another million dollars in legal fees. Um, and I think there are, were ways that could have been done. And uh, we're definitely talking about the new one that um, Mr. Russo announced and how whether we proceed the way he planned to proceed, or whether it could be done in a more um, uh, a way that's not now called the East Oakland injunction, but, but based on individual gangs and or individual specific neighborhood blocks uh, rather than an entire community. So it's, it's very difficult and it is, um, leads to another issue, is one of the 
parts of the budget. People usually pay the attention to the money part. They don't pay much to the preamble with the budget principles. And one of the new budget principles that I'm um, proposing that as whenever a legal case goes over 100,000 that it must be reviewed by the city council to continue. Because frankly, a lot of us are surprised how much had been spent on the injunction. Um, and we would have, and there are a couple other cases too where we've spent now nearly a million dollars in legal fees that maybe could have been settled or done other ways. So um, it is leading and teaching us how to deal with and control expenses when you have an elected city attorney. Hi, I have two questions. I'll try to be quick. Um, the first is for Mayor Kwan. Um, I want to ask why you think that we spend 40% of Oakland's budget on the Oakland Police Department when we know that long-term safety is created by the Allendale Rec Center, by youth programs, by access to libraries and education, by the re-entry support that you were talking about earlier. Um, and then the second question is for um, Council Member Schaff. Um, you mentioned due process about the gang injunctions and I'd like to push back on that idea. I think that um, we've seen that the people on this list have had no access to public defenders, um, that the city attorney spent his $270,000 salary this year trying to make sure that they didn't have access to lawyers, that they paid $1,000 to show up in court, which we beat back, but that was having to fight him very hard on that. Um, that defendants in this case have so far spent two months in jail for riding in a car with a co-defendant, um, have been tailed by undercover police officers Minute, at please. the Cinco de Mayo festival and arrested for walking next to a co-defendant, were arrested for attempted robbery to try to get his own bike, his own bike that he owned back from a neighbor. Um, another defendant was beaten severely by the police while being arrested on a drug charge. Um, is that your idea of due process? How should we proceed? Thank you. Just um, due process, I, I'm a recovering attorney, so due process means that they do have their day in court and they have, uh, it's, it appears they've all secured very, very effective and um, hardworking pro bono representation, inclu including Michael Siegel, who was here today. I will take everything that you said into consideration as I uh, make my decision about how to vote on Tuesday. Thanks. The reason the police and fire department are such a big part of budget, and quite frankly, they're lower now. Last year, they were three quarters of our budget, but because we couldn't even get a vote on the, um, the, the I was about to say that, <laughs> is because, and again, she, she wants me to make sure that you know that's not the entire budget, but it's a general fund. The other half of the budget is pretty much stipulated. It's like redevelopment and federal grants, et cetera, et cetera, that we have to spend it that way. But um, last year it was 75% of the general fund. This year it's only 60. Why? Because we laid off 80 officers. Um, and the reason why it's such a big part is that in, Quite frankly, we pushed a lot of public works things into the landscape and lighting improvement district. And I remember when I was running the campaign, we actually passed it to give a, a cost of living increase. And then a case came down in San Jose, which said the methodology has to be house by house rather than district by district. So it was it, that we were thinking that developing a system that decides how close every house is to a park a public light and a median strip would probably cost as much money as we, we would get from the parcel tax increase. Um, so we're still trying to consider what to do with that. But we pushed a lot of those services outside of the general fund because of the way Prop 13 was written so that they could make more room for police and fire. Part of the reason is in this area, in this state, we pay police a lot more than other parts of the country, nearly twice as much. And then if you add on the pension fund, which is a pretty rich pension fund, uh, average Oakland police officer, I'm not saying that they do, but an average officer could retire at age 50 with a $100,000 pension and at this point they wouldn't have contributed anything to that. That's an unsustainable system and that's why we are now trying to, again, I don't begrudge people good pensions, they just need to help pay for it. And so um, that's why we're, we're looking at, at that and that's why it's such a big part of the budget. We do need a sizable number of officers in the city. This is a big city with a lot of crime. Are we using our officers as effectively as we could? Maybe not. I'm looking at civilianizing more positions and using civilians to do some of the things. Like, So for instance, the most annoying thing and one that got a lot of dots was burglaries. 
There's no reason why we couldn't have civilian techs come out, take the evidence, and take the report. You don't need a police officer on 911 to do that. So that's one of the things. But the irony is I have to have extra money to hire the civilians to even do that. And as, as the economy comes up, I'm going to try to hire some civilians as well as officers sort of more equally in order to do that. Hi, my name is Mary. I just first off wanted to say thank you very much for letting us ask questions and also responding so thoroughly um, on a Saturday. I think I really appreciate that. Um, my question surrounds trying to create more unity in Oakland. I don't think you need to live here very long to, to see how divided our city can be a lot of the time and um, at the same time how beautiful this city really is with how much diversity we have and how many different communities that we have in such a small geographic area. Um, and I think one reason, one issue that we kept keep getting really divided on is issues around policing and public safety. And um, the police department does have very different relationships with different communities in Oakland. Um, so I'm wondering, as being very creative um, representatives of our city, I'm wondering what innovative, creative strategies the two of you have to creating more unity in Oakland that don't actually rely on the police department, but actually are trying to build up communities' abilities to resolve their own problems. Um, that was really well said. Um, and I, if anybody knows me, I am just such a big Oakland fan. I love this city. I am so passionate about it. Um, and, and one of the things I love so much about it is its diversity. Um, and a lot of cities ha have a lot of different types of people living in them, but year after year the census shows that in Oakland we actually live in the same neighborhoods together, side by side. And that, that is something that is unique about this city, uh, more so than anywhere else. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to probably put my foot in it around this the gang injunction, which I don't like calling the gang injunction, I call it neighborhood protective orders, is, is an issue. I am passionate about restorative justice, and that's something that Oakland is really in the lead on. Um, we have, have committed resources to it. Um, I am passionate about youth empowerment, about intervention strategies. I worked for Mayor Jerry Brown and was on the steering committee of Project Choice, which is this amazing uh, program that is just just decimating recidivism rates and getting people into good paying jobs, you know, g getting the box off that the job application. I am passionate about all that good stuff. I'm very glad that I think our police chief is a very progressive police chief. You know, he's been championing the call-in process and I won't bore you with what that is if you don't know about it, but it's it's again, it's progressive stuff. At the same time, we have a real problem in this city. And we, it just breaks my heart. I just cannot stand the violence that is going on. And so I don't think we need to be on one side or another. I don't think you need to be like, I'm law enforcement. I'm you know, restorative justice. I think that um, we, we've got to understand that sometimes people can be very passionate about both. And, and honestly, Measure Y is kind of an example of that. What passed at the ballot place, and believe me, there were a lot of different things tried before, was this kind of balance of intervention and enforcement. Um, I agree that our, the relationship between every community and the police is not perfect, but I can tell you that there are so many officers that are so committed to improving it, okay? So um, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question about creative ways, but I do think it, Oakland is on the forefront of a lot of creative ways um, around restorative justice around using the call-ins, and we are going to continue to um, be a national model for those. At the same time, we also cannot close our eyes to serious problems that are going in, on in our neighborhoods, so you know, I am not going to back off on enforcement as well. I think we just have to do it all, and um, you know, I, I think the great uh, things that bring people together are the arts and food. So I think we all need to dance more, sing more, and eat more. How's that? <laughs> so, um, you know, I wrote Major Y, and um, despite the fact that the numbers of police officers have come down since we reached our peak, uh, crime is still going down, even in this year. And I'm pretty surprised with the recession and the high unemployment in some neighborhoods. On the other hand, murders are up this year, and I think that represents some tension among some particular pockets of gangs and um, some tensions, increased tensions on, on drug dealing, et cetera. But in general, 
despite that, crime in general is still going down. And I think it's because we've moved towards geographic, strengthening our beats and geographic collaboration between neighbors and beat officers, and that we have at the same time put in prevention programs that are aimed at the people coming out of jail and coming out of juvenile hall. Now we're about to get potentially overwhelmed by the state if Jerry releases more people. So we really have to, I'm saying a lot of my energy focusing on him and what he's gonna do and I'm hoping that he'll use a more progressive Detroit model where people give if, if he's releasing people in prisons, that he gives us a sizable amount of money to put people to work in jobs and to have community organizations that works with them that keeps people out of trouble and gives them a fresh start. And um, that's why I was amazed at Michigan's recidivism, 18% compared to our 80. So, um, and that's a program that literally, instead of sending kids to CYA or away, that, that puts them in these very intensive community programs with counseling and job training. And you know, this is my ongoing debate with Chip Johnson. He makes it sound like I only do this. Um, I also fight for policing, and I think it's that combination that you need to do it. In terms of new initiatives, uh, Rashida over here knows that I'm working on um, less officers involved in, the, in investigating our cells and um, um, a little bit more outside civilian oversight that the mayor's office and others are going to overtake and put more of our officers back out on the street and then to me the thing I'm most excited about is a program that I'm starting to people I addressed this morning uh, to make sure that we really grow our own future police department and so that is taking high school students and, and giving them a, a job a, a opportunity to be cadets or explorers and interns and then to feed them into the Merritt College Law and Justice program and then to recruit those people straight out into the Oakland Police Department partly because I can get them to take a big percentage of their academy classes, why they're still in community college, and then I can be assured that I get kids who are from our area who are more sensitive to the community to begin with. You're the last one, and we've got to make you the last one so that these people who've been very kind and we're now an hour over um, will uh, uh, be able to go home. Thank you. My name is Jay, and I have two questions. One is, I, want, I was looking at the, the pie chart in the, in the pamphlet that you Handed out, and I see that you know there's 40% of the money is going. Yeah, exactly. 40% of the budget, uh, the general fund is going to the police department, but then only the libraries only get 2% as it exists, and parks and rec only get 3%. So I just want to know, like, how is the decision made around that? Um, and then I also wanted to know if you are, um, if you're thinking about. So, so a couple of people asked questions about like what are, what are some alternatives that don't actually involve the police, you know? And, and some alternatives that you just put out there, um, it's really great to hear that you're thinking about alternatives. Um, but I, w I really wanna hear if you're looking at any truly community-based alternatives. So programs that are run for communities, by communities. Um, because there are a lot of examples out there. Um, for instance, Home Use Empowerment Project um, and you know, violence pre prevention programs that are run out of Eastside Arts Alliance. Um, so there are examples in the Bay Area of programs that are doing that, that kind of work. Thanks. I'll just be really quick. Um, the library share would really, if you included the major Q, would be more like four, the equivalent of another slice, because it's nine million general fund, about 11 million in major Q, so it's 20 million dollars for the libraries. And Believe it or not, that's really huge for a city. There are cities around California that have eliminated all libraries, much less have 18 branches. Now, I've really fought for 18 branches and people keep beating me up saying we don't need so many, we don't need libraries at all, people can go to the internet. But in reality, in our town, libraries are more like community centers. And probably the one thing that we can do to save money is bringing rec centers, senior centers, community centers into the same facility. And that's one of the things I'll be looking at in the next 10 year plan so we save facility and staffing costs, but still have them have that concept of, of being a community center. So that's, I think, my part of the answer. And I'll just say I support exactly what the mayor said. I think those are all great ideas. Um, we are an, over, an hour over, so I'm, I'm going to bypass my closing remarks and just, I, it was great seeing everybody here today, and the conversation will continue.
So please come, and I forgot to announce this. If you really care about the schools, I want to recruit all of your friends and relatives on September 10th at Westlake Middle School. We need to get a couple of thousand volunteers into the schools, including my mentoring program. So tell everybody, this is your chance to volunteer in the schools. Uh, September 10th, lots of advance notice, Westlake Middle School, that's the one right near Lakeshore Park, Park um, at, from 1 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Thank you very much for coming.